Okay, hello everybody. My name is Lita Abella and welcome to my show, What's Your Story in the New Normal? I have two amazing guests today, Pilar Escontrias and Dana Sadati Soto. So my guests today are going to speak on a hot topic in the legal community as a result of COVID-19. But first, let's get to know a little bit about them. So Pilar, I'm gonna start with you. First, can you tell me your name, where you're from, where do you live now, your age? You know, just I just sure. wanted to know a little bit about you, you know, your career and so forth. So go ahead. Sure. Hi everyone, hi listeners. <laughs> My name is Pilar Escontrias. I'm a 3L, a third year law student at University of California at Irvine School of Law. I am, I took kind of a non-traditional path to the legal profession. Um, I ended up majoring in art and archaeology in college, and I then went to get a master's and a PhD in anthropology, um, and then I went to law school. So I'm, a, you know, a little bit older. I'm almost 34, but the, the 30s are the best years for women, I've been told. So I'm, I'm living my life. I'm loving it, um, and I am really excited to work alongside um, my new friend and fellow. Uh, warrior in this uh, whole thing we're doing, Donna. So I, I actually currently am staying with my brother in LA. This is my niece's bedroom because <laughs> I didn't want to be alone, but I didn't want to go visit my parents. Uh, they're older, uh, given all of the Corona, you know, situation, but I live full time in Irvine. Oh, okay. I was going to say that would have been a long commute from LA to Irvine. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and Donna, how about you? Hi listeners, my name is Donna Sadati Soto. I grew up in Southern California in the greater Long Beach area. Um, I technically attend Harvard Law School in Cambridge, Massachusetts, but given COVID-19, um, as most folks know, a lot of institutions have gone remote. So I am now in my childhood bedroom <laughs> at my parents' house back in Southern California. Um, so, I'm a third year law student. I um, worked part time while I was living in Cambridge, Massachusetts as an LSTAT instructor. I can talk about that a little bit more later. Um, but my day sort of is consumed by the work that Bilad and I are doing, um, as well as balancing my classes and some of my other obligations. Um, the two big ones are, I also serve as the executive editor of the Harvard Latinx Law Review It. Harvard, um, and I'm also a student attorney at the Harvard Legal Aid Bureau, which is a two-year clinical program where students help low-income clients um, and communities in the greater Boston area. So we still are doing our casework. We're just doing it remote. Um, so that also takes up a good chunk of my time interacting with clients. I have like six active cases right now. Wow. You both are so busy and have such amazing careers and, and things that you're doing in law school. That's, that's great. So um, I'm just going to real briefly tell the viewers how we actually connected. So my son just graduated from the University of San Francisco Law School, and he's had a rocky road with, with his um, law school career. So he was telling me that there was this petition going around about the July bar. And that he signed the petition, you know, he just took the February bar, but of course, you know, a lot of people, like more than 50% don't pass it on the first time. So there's, there's a, you know, a good reason that he may not pass the bar and would have to take the July bar again. And so he was telling me about it. And I said, oh my God, that's really interesting. And, and yes, all of us, we don't know what's happening with the July bar or the baby bar in June. And so I did some research into it, and that's how I, I found your names. And I said, wow, this is a really interesting topic. And such it's, I know that so many law students throughout California are really, really, really worried about this and what's going to mm -hmm. happen because the State Bar hasn't made a decision yet. So I, I know that you both are involved in this huge movement. So can you go ahead and just tell us what this movement is and you know, the points that you want to get across and what your like, call to action is on this. So we'll start with Pilar. Sure. sure. So I just want to like highlight the origin story of how this whole movement got started, because I think it speaks a lot to how grassroots we are. You know, I mean, we now have 
almost 1400 signatories. We're getting legislators involved. We've CC'd, you know, we've been in direct communication with the state bar, the board of trustees, and we have a pretty significant movement behind us and a lot of uh, support. But this all began because of the Facebook page <laughs> where, you know, um, we had seen what was going on in New York and students really pushing their state bar there to advocate for diploma privilege. Um, and so when the decision came out from the New York Court of Appeals, I just started writing. I, I had like a paragraph, you know, and I put, I made a post on um, a Facebook page and Donna immediately, a lot of people said, this is a great idea. Um, Donna was like, let me help, you know, let me actually put in the work, let me put in the labor. And so within three hours, she and I had co-written this document that is circulating and served as the basis for the petition. And then thereafter, the basis for our letter to the Supreme Court of California, which is a little bit shorter and more succinct and concise. Um, but this really began, uh, I think it's important to highlight, it really began with two women of color, two Latinas, who had never met in person. We've wow. never, I mean, we've only ever had like conversations over Zoom and FaceTime and all of that. And now we're talking about living together in LA after we graduate. So I just want to highlight, yeah. So I just want to highlight for listeners that these beautiful like constellations of people come together in very unexpected ways, right? This wasn't like she and I knew each other and we put it together. It was because we just felt like doing the work and, and it became a movement. So I think that that's important to know. It's completely grassroots. It's completely bottom up, right? So we started this because of the New York movement, have gained a lot of traction. Um, unlike other states that have made pretty quick decisions as to what they're gonna do about the July bar, California, and we do applaud California for sort of taking its time, right? They're, they don't wanna like make any rash decisions and, um, and, and step back and come back from them. But basically the diploma privilege movement we really see as a national solidarity movement of students but it's also important to note they're not just students they're recent graduates and they're all people who we stand in solidarity with everyone who is attempting to, wants to apply for the to entrance into the california legal profession this isn't limited to class of 2020 graduates and that's really important to highlight because younger uh or earlier classes than us are really facing particularly dire circumstances where they have perhaps already taken the bar or they haven't and they're given now notice by their employers that if they don't pass the bar, they don't have a job. So we are just beginning our legal career. There are students, uh, you know, uh, members of our coalition who have taken the bar a couple of times and it's important to note that we include them in, in our petition as well. Um, so I'll let Donna maybe talk a little bit about what diploma privilege is and what our process has been since we started the petition. Of course. So one note, Bilad, on what you said. So we're trying to make this as inclusive of um, students and recent graduates as we can. One other um, group of folks we want to make sure that we include in this is LLM students. I think a lot of times conversations around uh, law students center on JD students. We also are trying to recognize the very unique needs of LLM students, right? Many students were booted off of their law school like housing, and that really hurt LLM students who have family all over the world. Um, and so they had to sort of scramble to figure out where they were gonna live. Um, also just this um, delay or postponement or all these other um, solutions to the bar exam, it, they're especially concerning for LLM students because they're depending on it for not just their career, um, financial reasons, family reasons, but often immigration reasons. Um, a lot of times they sort of expect employer sponsorship and now with, the, with all that's happening with the pandemic um, and the uncertainty around licensing, it causes a big issue for LLM students. So I, I just wanted to underscore that. Um, but Bilal, to your question, you know, what is diploma privilege? Diploma privilege is this idea that upon completion of law school, right, you would be um, allowed to practice law in uh, the jurisdiction of, of your choosing. Bilal and I specifically have been advocating a lot for California. However, as Pilar mentioned, this is sort of a national solidarity movement. There are movements springing in all different jurisdictions um, aiming to end up with diploma privilege. Um, 
you know, there was a, a white paper that sort of gave the different alternatives to the bar exam, right? Some of those were like online administration of the exam, postponement of the exam, supervised practice, diploma privilege, diploma privilege plus. And, you know, Pilat and I put a lot of thought into it and we, and, um, we sort of concluded that everything that's going on with the pandemic, the ways that it's, that it's affecting law students, their careers, their family members, their livelihood, their physical and mental health, uh, diploma privilege really was the only thing that was going to meet the needs of students. Um, and so, as Pilata mentioned, that's what we've been advocating for and advocating for among a number of different stakeholders, especially in the state of California. Let me ask you this. So, when I went to law school, which was uh, like around 2000 to 2004, and I think things are still the same way, we had the certified law clerk. Um, you know, when you're in law school, you're, you're working under the supervision of a supervising attorney. I worked the um, Riverside District Attorney's Office, and I also worked for the uh, Department of Justice uh, Attorney General's Office in downtown LA. And so how is diploma privilege different than being a certified law clerk where you can go to court, you can do depositions, you can represent clients as long as it's all under a supervising attorney? Mm -hmm. So that's great um, that you were able to have that experience with the district attorney's office. It's not, unfortunately, a consistent experience across different types of law. So I, while, and Donna and I actually have an op-ed coming out in the Daily Journal, um, Monday or Tuesday, we're not, we haven't yet received uh, final confirmation, but we do touch upon some of these points in that article, most specifically about the role that public interest attorneys or excuse me, the limited role public interest attorneys would have were California to go forward with a provisional licensing scheme that requires that we um, study under or sort of like an apprenticeship program under um, more advanced attorneys. So specifically, I'm going to be working at the California Appellate Project. And um, so I'm going to be a public defender. Given the Sixth Amendment right to competent counsel under our Constitution and the right to, um, you know, appeals end up coming up under in, um, IAC claims, which is, um, oh my gosh, why am I totally blanking right now? Um, ineffective assistance of counsel claims. Uh, so in those instances that, you know, it actually creates um, kind of a sticky situation for students who want to go into public defender's offices, for example. When I was interning at public defender's offices, I couldn't actually take on clients and represent them in court, specifically because of potential appellate problems, right? And ensuring that uh, folks get competent as, uh, assistance of counsel, that would have been a perfect kind of appeal later on. Saying, you know, I had this certified law clerk that wasn't good, that wasn't good enough, and had I had a real attorney, I probably would have uh, had a better outcome or better disposition for my case. So although in some instances a, a law clerk type of extension program may be helpful, public defenders will not be able to practice. We would still be sort of relegated to like research. Um, there's just one example of how that works. Also, I think it's important to note the provisional licensing scheme, which is becoming really popular among uh, deans in California law schools as a kind of middle ground that really does end up um, hurting students with families, students of color, students who have significant debt, because the idea behind this provisional licensing program is that for one to two years, you're working under an attorney, at which point at the end of that provisional period, you must take the first available bar exam. So that's, you know, in theory sounds great, but what does that mean in practice? What does that mean materially for us? That means that some people will be able to have the financial means to take three months off of their job to adequately prepare for the exam. Um, and some people won't. Will we have paid leave? Will we not? You know, like these are the actual like gritty, like down in the weeds questions that some that we believe uh, some of the advocates for provisional licensing haven't carefully thought through. Um, our big law, our friends who are going into big law may very well have these accommodations provided to them, but those of us who are going into public interest are not. It also leaves out people who want to do solo practice. You know, that's, although it's a limited number, again, solo practice, uh, especially in California, is overwhelmingly um, 
people of color who end up going into solo practice oftentimes because they didn't get a job or they want to sort of go out on their own. So that leaves them out as well. So let's, let's assume your, your movement, your privilege, diploma privilege uh, movement gets passed in the state of California <clears throat> and takes place. Will the law students in this group that you're referencing, will they eventually at some point take the California bar? I think um, to Pilar's earlier point, it is difficult in practice to have students, you know, uh, practice under a provisional licensing for, I don't know, 12 months, 18, 24 months, and then expect them at some point in the near future to take the bar exam because it's incredibly disruptive to someone's legal career. So perhaps you are um, employed and getting paid during that time that you're working under the provisional license. Then at some point, you're going to either have to take time off um, to study for the bar exam, which could be two to three months full time, right? And that raises a, a number of questions. D are you going to get paid time off? Are you going to be granted that leave by your employer? Will you just have to quit your job? And there's a number of financial implications there. Um, alternatively, you have to continue working full time and then figure out how you work full time and study full time for the bar exam. Now, there's plenty of folks that go to school and work at the same time. I was one of those people. It's incredibly difficult to do. And the bar exam itself is um, something that requires a lot of time. There's a number of different subjects. So expecting students to study full time for that while working is incredibly hard. And it's going to disproportionately impact those individuals who um, have to work full time because they have to support themselves or their families versus, uh, you know, taking this exam with folks that have the um, ability to quit their job, have the ability to have paid time and will dedicate the entirety of two to three months to studying while other students are going to have to scramble to find the time to study in the midst of working full time as well. And just to add to that, oh, I'm sorry, just to add to that, the other, you know, the other part of it is that a lot of these folks who are advancing provisional licensing are pretty explicit in that if you don't register to take the first available exam, um, or if you take the exam and you fail, then your provisional license is gone. So it doesn't allow the kind of ability that are under ideal circumstances, did we not have, if were we not to have COVID, right? Usually employers allow one or two uh, failed bar attempts, especially in California because our pass rate is significantly lower than other states. So what happens to those folks who aren't able to take time off to study for three months, they fail, and then they're additionally out of a job. And I don't think we have to, I mean, maybe we need to start discussing more openly mental health and what the failure of a bar exam does to a person and does to their sense of personhood and well-being and uh, confidence and all of these things, but we don't want to create a, you know, a generation of attorneys who like have less self-worth because of an exam because of certain uh, historical moment in which we find ourselves. I mean, this is a very specific time. We can't reiterate how um, traumatizing, how traumatic this moment is, how serious it is, and we really encourage the bar and the Supreme Court of California to respond accordingly to the call um, because we cannot have our comrades left behind. We cannot have folks who didn't pass the bar twice and not be part of our movement. We can't have people who have families and who work full time in addition to going to school not be part of our movement. So just circling back to Donna's earlier point, this is an over-inclusive move movement. We're trying to include as many people as possible because frankly, at the end of the day, most practitioners who are so committed to the bar exam are the first people to tell you it doesn't tell you anything about competence, you know? So there's this weird way in which people are simultaneously saying, yeah, it doesn't really tell you what, how great of an attorney you'll be, dot, 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 but you got to do it. Like it's a right of passage. Um, and so a professor at Clara actually encourage all listeners to read this article she just published in law.com. Um, her name is Britt Benjamin, and she talked about 
um, the bar as a sort of um, gatekeeper. And additionally, um, you know, it's it's sort of why we're so committed to this gatekeeping mechanism. It really forced the question. So you you mentioned something kind of significant to me, which was the mental health. So. Um, for full disclosure, I, I do work for the State Bar of California, but I just want to be perfectly clear that this little show that I'm creating and so forth, this is everything on my own. This has nothing to do with the State Bar or the Lawyer's Assistance Program. It just so happens that I'm the person that works at the Lawyer's Assistance Program that conducts outreach to law students, State Bar applicants, and attorneys on substance use and mental health issues. And I give presentations to the uh, law students and bar applicants, and I do MCLE presentations to attorneys throughout California. So when you, when you said mental health, that kind of right, hit it on the, the nail on the head for me, because I, I know a lot about how um, law students and attorneys are suffering from those issues. And yes, we've seen it now where it's stress levels and anxiety is just increasing tenfold with, with everything that's going on. And granted, it's, it's in other industries too. But, um, and then that's why I thought this was such a interesting topic to, to talk about. You know, there's, there's always, and, and you know, in the law, there's always two sides to every story. You know, it's not black, it's not white. There's that gray area that where it, where it lays. Um, so I think some of the questions that if, if I'm going to play devil's advocate here would be people on the other side would say, one, well, it isn't fair for those of us that did, you know, study, take the bar, and whether we took, we passed on the first time, the fifth time, the 10th time, or the 20th time, um, that's not fair for, for us. And it's, you know, yeah, there's a lot of, you know, ca ca catastrophes that happen in the world, you know, especially us in California, we have the fires, the floods, the earthquakes, and everything in between. So what would you say to those people who it's like, you know, suck it up and you guys will just have to wait and take the next bar whenever it is. I mean, I'm just being perfectly honest. I think it's a little bit difficult to um, accept this suck it up and take the next bar argument because this really is a special, unique, um, circumstance that we find ourselves in. Yes, to your point earlier, there are catastrophes that happen annually. We haven't seen anything in recent history that looks like this, that is a global pandemic that has impacted the world, that um, has booted people from their campus, that has caused at almost everything to shut down. People are confined to their homes. Um, I, you know, went to go grab bleach for my mom at Walmart or something, and you can't go into stores without a mask anymore. It's something that I've never experienced in my life. And so I understand that folks had to put in the time, the energy, and the money to study and take past bar exams, but they didn't have to do it in these circumstances. And so expecting students to suck this up is a massive ask that I think is just, it's not a fair ask and it's just not possible for a lot of students. So at least for me, you know, earlier I mentioned that I was an LSAT instructor. I lost my job <laughs> as an in-person LSAT instructor, right? Because there were no more in-person classroom environments in which to teach. And so that money that I was earning as an LSAT instructor at Harvard, that paid my rent. I couldn't afford my rent anymore, so I moved back home. And I was lucky that I had somewhere that I could move to. I don't know what would have happened if I didn't have somewhere else to go, right? And Bilad and I, through this movement, we have heard so many narratives of folks that are so directly impacted by this. It's impacting their health, the health of their family members. Folks are scared to do the daily activities that we used to to be able to do. So this really is unprecedented times. Here's um, one last question. So I'm looking at the stats for the number of attorneys in the state of California, and we have over 253,000 active and inactive attorneys in California. And for active, we have just under 190,000 
attorney, active attorneys in California. So lay people, I think, would be saying, we've got a lot of attorneys in California. We don't need to do these special circumstances for this, these groups, this group of law students. What would your response to that be? Um, so I guess the, the first thing is that we have no, we have not yet reached the apex of this epidemic. We have no sense of how this is going to affect people yet. What we do know is that people are going to be suffering evictions, for example. Right now, Governor Newsom has a moratorium. Once that's lifted, the moment that's lifted, if people don't pay their rent in its entirety, they will be subject to eviction proceedings. We have more immigrants in detention than most states. Um, those people are awaiting adjudication of their cases. They are also suffering immensely from spreads of COVID-19 um, inside of uh, private detention centers. We have clients who, because courts are shut down, um, pu public defenders and district attorneys are overwhelmed and are joining um, in movements together to get folks released. I mean, that's pretty remarkable. How often do you see that happening, right? And it's happening in New York, um, soon hopefully to be happening in Los Angeles as well. So the legal need is not going to maintain the consistency across time, it's only going to increase. And to Donna's point, I also just want to acknowledge the fairness aspect. It's not fair. It's not fair that a student last year, two years ago, had to go through everything they had to go through to take the exam. But movements are built on recognizing unfairness. If all of our predecessors, if all of our generations of ancestors responded with young folks who wanted to make a change by saying, well, you got to suck it up because I did, we would not have had the type of racial equality, not that we have it, but we have a better amount of it. We would not have the type of gender equality if, if, if women of older generations just said, you know, I didn't have to vote, so you gotta like get with it and just know your place, right? So, and in fact, to that point, we have so many um, practitioners who have supported us in this effort and we have professor, professors who have, and some of these practitioners, um, you know, send us like emails. Some of them are future employers of ours, like just telling us, thank you for what you're doing. Like this is going to help our communities. So um, although there are those people who think that we always need to live by the same, um, you know, under the same circumstances, pass the same gatekeeping um, mechanisms that keep us out from the profession, there are tenfold who, who agree with us in this and who think that they want to support us because they know how hard it was to do it and they don't want to have that for another generation of people, especially under these circumstances. I understand. So my last question to you, because we're under a time limit here and I, I know your time's very valuable. Um, so what's your call to action? Who's your target audience? And what do you need to move your movement forward? Donna, you want to take that? Sure. So um, as Milan and I have uh, sort of talked about for the last number of minutes, um, what has come of COVID-19 for us in particular is this recognition that the legal profession and legal community um, is uh, inflexible in a lot of ways and that it can't respond to a lot of the needs of different community members at different instances in time. And so for us, we, um, one, for law students, urge folks to start um, thinking about this, though I'm sure it's been at the forefront of so many people's minds, right, because the bar exam was scheduled to come up very quickly. Um, and, you know, if you haven't signed the petition <laughs> and you agree with the points for diploma privilege, please do so. We also, um, ask a lot of the major stakeholders, right? Whether it's the state bar, whether it's the judiciary here in California, whether it's law school deans, to include students in the process of decision-making to be transparent um, so that uh, uh, not just students, but even just future clients can think about the ways that they can have their voices heard in this process as well. Um, and then probably most pressing is we really urge the State Bar of California, their Board of Trustees, the Committee of Bar Examiners, um, and the Supreme Court of California to really consider the practicality 
um, and the urgency of coming up with some sort of creative, innovative solution that works for students, especially those students that have been most impacted um, by COVID-19 and to remember those needs and to um, be able to respond accordingly. Great information. Any last words from you, Pilar? Uh, I guess I would just say that we're doing this, you know, I, I really also urge people to be compassionate with students and with clients and to be as charitable as you can in interpreting our movement and what we're trying to do. Folks are saying, you know, entitled millennials. I don't think I'm a millennial anymore because I'm in the middle. <laughs> but anyway, I'll take the, I'll take the, uh, <laughs> the, the um, insult and, and just sort of say like, you know, this isn't about entitlement. This is actually like, we are here for our clients. Like we identify and as our, as our daily journal article uh, states, like we have spent our careers, our families have spent their lives trying to work for our community. Um, and this is no different. And just because we're going up against an institution, which we don't think we're going up against, we just want to be participator, but be participants in in the decision making process, you know. But it is very much a sort of now adversarial in in the media, um, because we're really asking people to think seriously about whether the bar is the only metric that you can use this year to decide whether we're competent or not. So think of our clients, think of the people who are in jails, in prisons, in detention centers, think of the farm worker who is now, you know, probably experiencing extreme amounts of wage theft, who's now, you know, at higher rates of, of potentially contracting COVID because they're essential workers and who are now under attack by the present administration because the Trump administration wants to employ a, a wage, um, what is, I forget the word, but they want to basically cut down wages of farm workers to increase the, um, you know, the, the, t the amount that small farmers are able to produce. So there are assaults on everyone. And we're certainly not saying the assault on law students is the most pressing. We're not saying that we are more deserving of anyone's special, you know, um, attention or anything. We're just saying this is the world we're entering and we want to help these folks help us get there. So please don't forget those people who the law purports to serve. Um, and in California, that's a vast and beautifully diverse constituency, which legislators um, alike and the Supreme Court acknowledge are those who we should always be thinking of when we're thinking about you know, these types of changes. So please don't forget them um, and allow us to help you in that. Okay, so I want to thank my guest, Pilar Escontrias, and Donna Sadati Soto for joining me on my new show, What's Your Story in the New Normal? My name's Lita Abella, and until next time, we'll see you then. Thank you. Thank you, Lita. <laughs>